Chapter 2, Part 3, Habituation General Principles. In an earlier video, I made a distinction between learned behavior, that is, behavior shaped by classical or operant conditioning, and habituation. Even though some definitions of learning exclude habituation, most learning theorists, including Mazur, who wrote the textbook, do consider habituation to be a simple form of learning. Habituation is a decrease in a reflexive response with repetition of the stimulus that elicits it. Here's one example with rats responses to a cat odor. In an experiment published in 1999 in the Journal of Comparative Psychology, Dielenberg and McGregor exposed rats to cat colors that smelled like cats, so with cat odor on them. The first time they presented a collar to a particular rat, the rat would hide for a long time, almost 17 minutes on average, at least according to this graph. Dielenberg and McGregor would wait a little while after the rat had stopped hiding and then present the collar again. With each subsequent trial, that is presentation of the collar that had cat odor on it, the time spent hiding decreased. The rat stopped hiding a little bit sooner. That is, the response to the collar hab habituated. Habituation of reflexive responses when the eliciting stimulus is repeated has been observed in newborn babies and a wide range of animal species uh, and even some single-celled organisms, including uh, Stentor ceruleus and slime mold. If you've ever read about brainless learning, that's usually habituation. In a Psychological Review article way back in 1966, Thompson and Spencer listed six general principles of habituation that can be observed in all animal species. Let's review them now. Number one, the course of habituation is typically gradual with relatively large changes between the first few presentations of the stimulus and much smaller changes in the later presentations. This graph shows how long a two month old baby looked at a particular stimulus, in this case, a jar of peppers that was presented repeatedly. The first repetition, the stimulus was so novel, so the, the infant looked at it a long time, more than 30 seconds before looking away. So she'd never seen this particular jar of peppers before and she stared at it for over 30 seconds before she looked away. With each subsequent repetition, the time she spent looking at the jar got shorter. But not only that, the relative difference in time also decreased. The second time was less than half of the first, but by the fourth and fifth time, she only looked at the jar briefly and for almost the same amount of time both times, indicating that gradual decrease in the orienting response and the stability of habituated of the habituated response at the shorter duration. Number two, if the eliciting stimulus is withheld for some time after habituation has occurred and then presented again, the reflexive response usually recovers. This is one reason some people might not consider habituation to be learning. The change in behavior potentiality is not relatively permanent, as Kimball would say, because it requires the continued presentation of the stimulus. For my last job, the building where I worked was pretty old. When I first down, sat down at my computer in the morning, I would find the creaking noises from the elevators in the building quite distracting. But over time, I would habituate to the sounds, and before long, it was as if I couldn't hear them. However, if I went somewhere else and then came back, the elevator noises were almost as annoying as they had been at the beginning of the day. Number three, even though habituation disappears in the absence of the eliciting stimulus, when it does reoccur, habituation happens faster than it did the first time. Case in point, 
it would take my distracted response longer to habituate to elevator noises at work on Monday mornings than it did on Friday afternoons. Number four, more intense stimuli produce stronger reflexive responses, and those responses are also more resistant to habituation. Elevator noise was a small annoyance for me, but when there was construction on my hallway, that was a problem that continued to make it difficult to concentrate on my work. Number five, just like Ebbing has found in his memorization experiments, overlearning can occur in habituation, meaning that future behavior potentiality continues changing even after the current response has stabilized. So suppose rats completely stopped hiding in response to cat odor after 15 presentations. Let's say you have a bunch of rats and on Monday you give half of them exactly 15 cat odor trials. So they stop uh, hiding. You give the other half of your rats 50 trials. They stop hiding and then you keep going for 45 more trials uh, where they're not hiding. If you give all the rats the next day off and then redid the experiment on Wednesday, the rats who got 50 trials would probably have a smaller reaction to the odor than the ones who only had 15 trials. In other words, although the additional 35 trials produced no additional changes in the rat's behavior at the time, they did increase long-term retention of the habituation. Number six, habituation can transfer from one eliciting stimulus to another, provided the stimuli are similar. So having habituated to the noise of the elevators in my office building uh, made it easier to habituate to the noise of construction but it did nothing to help with the blasts of cold air at random intervals when the heating system went on the fritz. The last video for chapter two is about opponent process theory. It was recorded by someone else for a slightly different purpose. It doesn't exactly match the content of the textbook, but the person in the video does a good job demonstrating and explaining opponent process theory using examples. We'll do a muddiest point minute reaction for opponent process theory in class, so you'll be able to ask any questions related to the chapter or the video.